Okay, um, so welcome everybody to our topical seminar series on uh, nuclear, hadronic, and today atomic uh, physics. Um, so we are welcoming uh, Guillem Alvareda. Uh, Guillem did his PhD at the Univers Autonomous University in Barcelona in electronic engineering and has had seen several postdoctoral positions uh, at Berlin, one at Hubei with a, a Beatriz de Pinos Fellowship and also Marie Curie Fellowship in the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. And he's currently based in, or officially, I guess, based in San Sebastian, but also in physically um, in Barcelona and Hamburg. And today he will be talking about uh, electronic dynamics with a new uh, method called conditional wave function as a theory. Uh, and yeah, we're really excited to see if there are any overlaps maybe with uh, our own uh, interests in the group. All right, Guillem. Thank you, you for coming. Take it away. Uh, Guillaume is happy to take questions uh, uh, during the seminar, so feel free to ask any questions either through the chat or out loud. Good, good. Thanks, Arnau. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this conditional wave function theory. This is a project that I started um, when I was in Berlin, um, more or less 2014. Um, the idea was basically to address um, the dynamics of electrons and nuclei um, couplet in, in, in molecular systems. So I was coming from an engineering department at the Autonomous University. And at that time I was you know, working on, on electron transport, quantum electron transport in, in nanostructures. And already there during my PhD, I started uh, working with the conditional wave function, but in a completely different uh, scenario, let's say. Um, so I basically, while in Berlin, uh, you know, extended this, this, this theory for uh, dealing with electron, uh, electrons and nuclei in, in molecular systems. So um, let me first uh, present my, my colleagues in Hamburg. This is the, the, the people that I work with uh, in this project, in this particular project. So Angel Rubio is, is uh, currently the, the director of the Max Planck Institute for the Structure and Dynamic of Matter in Hamburg. Um, Kevin, Kevin Lively uh, recently joined us as a PhD student, basically last year, October. Then there's Shunusuke. Shunusuke is, is halfway between uh, uh, Tsukuba in, 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 in uh, Japan and, and Hamburg. And finally, Aaron Kelly, uh, who uh, recently joined us as well. He was previously in Canada. Now he uh, has joined us uh, as a junior leader in, in Hamburg. Okay, so um, a bit of context, because probably this is a bit far from your expertise. So let me try to, um, you know, introduce you the, this system. Um, this is a, you know, a, a prototypical artificial uh, reaction center that is, is used to study uh, photosynthesis, uh, artificial photosynthesis. So it's made of uh, a carotene which is this long uh, array here. Then you have a porphyrin, porphyrin, and then a fullerene, C60. Um, so um, usually what happens is that this, this center here, the porphyrin center absorbs a, a, a light. So there's a charge rearrangement here. And then a, a primary process in, in photosynthesis is the electron transfer, an electron transfer for, from this porphyrin to the fullerene. So a charge transfer from here to here. And uh, so in the, in the top panel, what I show is, is um, a dynamics made of um, time dependent density functional uh, um, with frozen ions, let's say with frozen nuclei. And uh, basically what you see is that, uh, okay, this is going a bit slow. Um, you know, after this, this absorption of light, the, the, um, the excitation is mainly localized in the porphyrin. So it stays there no charge transfer at all, at least not from the porphyrin to the, to the fuller and center, right, in here. But if you now allow the, the, the nuclei to move, so, so let's say that the, the, the top panel is mainly uh, associated to boron by Heimer dynamics, um, where, where the nuclei are frozen. If we now allow the, the nuclei to move, basically there's a technique called um, TDDFT plus Berenfest, which allows to move um, the nuclei classically as classical particles on top of mean field potentials coming from the electrons, then what you see is a completely different dynamics. Um, 
let's see if this works. So after the uh, absorption of light in the porphyrin uh, center, what you see is a complete rearrangement of charge in the entire um, triad, in the entire uh, uh, complex molecule, right? And in particular, what you're going to see is that um, there's going to be a, you know, a charge transfer. So um, purple means a, an excess of charge. So you're going to see how there's going to be an excess of charge here in the, in the fuller end, which means that you know, some charge transfer after the excitation goes from the porphyrin to the, to the fuller end center. But what is important here, um, more than the details of the, of the dynamics, is that the, you know, uh, 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 allowing the nuclei to move radically changes the, 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 the entire process. So uh, one, what one could, could learn from, from these uh, videos, let's say, is that um, you know, uh, taking into account the, the nuclear motion is absolutely important uh, to describe uh, this type of process, in particular photosynthesis. So this is the state of the art simulations where um, you have, um, for the nuclei, you have a single trajectory, a single multi-configurational trajectory that describes the nuclei. And these nuclei evolve on top, as I said, uh, uh, of, of mean field uh, electronic potentials. Right. Um, this is still far from describing the, 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 the exact process. So one needs to go even beyond the, the bottom uh, panel. So by including, you know, at least the, 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 the statistics, let's say, of the nuclear distribution, instead of taking one single trajectory, one should take an ensemble of trajectories describing at least at the, at the initial time, the proper uh, quantum distribution of the nuclei, right? Furthermore, sometimes not, not, not here maybe, but in other uh, processes, quantum nuclear effects are also important. Channeling effects are, are important. For example, uh, coherence is, is also important in certain processes. So one, one needs to go beyond, beyond this. Um, Okay, so what, what's the, the, the standard way to, to approach these, um, these dynamics, these molecular dynamics from, from an ab initio point of view? This is what I try to, to explain in this, in this slide. So let's, let's assume that you start with the, in the, in the full uh, position representation of the problem where you have basically only Coulomb interaction between particles, right? And then you have electronic coordinates here, nuclear coordinates. That would be, you know, that would correspond to solving the full molecular Schrodinger equation in, 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 the, in the configuration space, right? But what, what is done usually is, um, you know, taking into account the, what is called the Bohr-Wang expansion of the molecular wave function. Um, this, this expansion is basically a sum over, you know, uh, electronic states uh, with some coefficients that uh, usually are called the, the nuclear components uh, in these ansatz. Um, this is an exact ansatz. It is a, just an expansion of the full molecular wave function. And once you introduce these ansatz into the full Schrodinger equation and trace out the electronic diffusion of freedom, what you end up with is uh, uh, with a, the, this, what is called the BO picture, the boron Penheimer picture, where the nuclei evolve on uh, a bunch of potential energy surfaces corresponding to different electronic states, right? So um, imagine that you start in the ground state, for example, which is the, the, the bottom line here, um, then uh, the dynamics can occur uh, adiabatically, so uh, associated to a single electronic state here. But if there's some coupling between the different uh, surfaces, which uh, is due to the what is called the non-adiabatic couplings, um, then you can have transfer probability between different electronic states. That's what is called non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. Um, what is important here is that 99% um, of the methods are based on this picture. And that's not a casualty. This is simply because uh, for historical reasons, um, it was first the, the electronic structure, structure what was uh, developed. So uh, it was really useful to take advantage of all this machinery that was constructed during the, the last 40 years, 50 years, um, to describe afterwards these molecular dynamics. So one, one can take um, any, any suitable uh, electronic structure package, package, 
compute the bio surfaces, the non adiabatic couplings, and then the dynamics, of course, in this nuclear subspace, um, according to some equations of motion, and, and which can be approximated at different levels, you know, ring polymer, uh, MCTDH, multi configurational time dependent heart rate, surface coping, multiple, th there's a bunch of, of, of methods. Um, already in, in the literature that um, allows to describe quite accurately uh, molecular dynamics. Most of them are, are mean field in a sense, um, which means that uh, um, it's, it's difficult to capture um, what I showed you before or other um, type of processes uh, that are relevant, like vision, like uh, even, even, even uh, the description of smaller molecular systems is, is, is sometimes complicated with mean field approaches. Um, a completely different um, picture, which is the one that I'm gonna uh, try to describe here, is what we call the conditional uh, wave function picture, the conditional decomp decomposition picture. This is still um, in the full configuration space. So that means that uh, we don't um, introduce um, electronic states in our, in our uh, description. And then everything happens in the, in the in the position representation, both for the electrons and for the nuclei. No tracing out of degrees of freedom, let's say. Okay. And <clears throat> there's only one method that uh, works in this picture, which is uh, uh, what I showed you before, this, this time dependent density functional theory coupled to Ehrenfest dynamics for the nuclei. This is uh, probably the only, the only method that works in this, in this uh, full configuration, full position representation of the problem. So it's it's basically mainly an explorate and and um, and we are we are working in there uh, to find uh, whether uh, you know new efficient approximations exist or not. And uh, okay, what, what I'm going to show to you is just uh, uh, um, an attempt to to find a, a, an a, a, an efficient method based on on that picture. Right, this picture uh, might be interesting. For example, where you have a really large number of bio surfaces involved with a large number also of, of, of uh, relevant non adiabatic couplings in, this, in, in these scenarios where the dynamics is completely non adiabatic, let's say, um, computing this or pre computing all these quantities, the bio surfaces, the non adiabatic couplings is extremely expensive, right? So, um, the idea is to to find a better a better description of this type of non adiabatic process uh, relying on a completely different picture. Okay, so what is a conditional wave function? the the uh, The idea is very simple. Um, you take a wave function which can be time dependent, time independent, doesn't matter at this point. Um, that depends on the electrons. This is the small r, capital R refers to the nuclear. And what you do is basically um, you project out or, or you, you project this wave function on a given electronic position. And then what you get is just a, you know, a slice, a, a nuclear slice, which is this one here. Imagine that this is the, uh, a very simple problem where you have one electron, one nuclear in one nuclear, uh, nucleus in 1D. So that would correspond to the uh, full probability density associated to this wave function. What you do is you just project on a given electronic position, which is this one here, and you get a slice. If you do the same for a, another electronic position, you get another slice, right? And you can do exactly the same for the, for the electron. So you can get electronic conditional wave functions by projecting the full molecular wave function on a given nuclear uh, uh, position. And basically what you get is now these slices here which are obviously uh, in this 2D problem perpendicular uh, uh, to the electronic ones. Okay, so assuming that you start with a bunch of, of, of configurations for R alpha, capital R alpha, like these points, you can always reconstruct the full wave function by you know, taking all these slices and reordering and putting them together. That's, that's what this transformation, I'm not gonna enter into detail, but you can use some type of transformation that allow you to, to put all these slices together to um, reconstruct the full wave function. You can do it either with nuclear conditional wave functions or with electronic conditional wave functions. This is pictorially 
uh, depicted in here. Okay. So the only important thing here is that you you know your your uh, configuration points um, are the number of configuration points is large enough to explore the entire support of the wave function. If if this is fulfilled, then you can uh, you know obtain any 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 information you want from the from the entire problem. So in this picture, let's say exactness is equivalent to exhaustiveness. Okay, so based on this idea, um, there's um, two different ways to, to construct conditional wave function. One is starting from the time independence Rodinger equation. This is uh, what is shown here. So you have this uh, time independence Rodinger, this eigenvalue problem here, right? And what you can do is uh, you can now take this equation and project, project it on top of a given um, electronic position. So basically what you get is this equation here. This is, the, this is what defines the conditional nuclear eigenstates. So it's a time independent problem, right? So, so you have the kinetic energy of the, of the nuclei. You have the, this is, that would be, that would correspond to the Coulomb interaction between electrons and nuclei, but now it's evaluated on a given electronic position. And then what you have is, is this, um, this what we call kinetic relation potential, which is um, a nonlinear term that depends on the full wave function. Um, in here, you can imagine what is encoded in here is the kinetic energy, uh, parameterized kinetic energy of the electrons. Um, so this is what the, this term represents. So what you end up is with this uh, eigen uh, uh, problem here, which is nonlinear because it depends on the entire uh, uh, um, number of slices that you have in order to reconstruct this full wave function. So it's nonlinear, but it's also coupled. So each conditional nuclear uh, eigenstate is coupled to the others. Um, of course, you can do the same for the conditional electronic eigenstates. You would end up with this uh, eigenvalue problem here. So and and of and of course you can do this for the ground state, but you can do it for for any any other um, exci excitation of the of the full uh, molecular wave function. Good. So this is one one um, particular thing you can do. So you can you can use this conditional wave function concept to define um, you know a subset of of nuclear. Um, eigenstates and, and, and electronic eigenstates, but you can do uh, something different, which is starting from the time dependent, sorry, this, this should be dependent here. For, you can start with the time dependence rolling an equation and do exactly the same, right? So you take the, the, the um, full uh, equation of motion for the molecular wave function, and then you project it on top of a, a given electronic position and what you end up is with this equation of motion for the conditional um, nuclear states, which are now time dependent. Okay, so again, you have the um, nuclear kinetic energy, the conditional Coulomb interaction um, evaluated on a given electronic trajectory. Alpha, sorry, I, I didn't mention that. Alpha refers to each um, one of these configuration points that you are, uh, are sampling with. And now this again, this this uh, this term here makes the equation nonlinear, but also non-hermitian, right? So these are uh, this this Hamiltonian is now non-hermitian because these terms here uh, can be complex. So they include um, the parameterized kinetic energy of the electrons, but also an advective uh, term, which uh, comes because of the you know arises because of the total time derivative in here. So you you have to take into account the the um, partial derivative with respect to time of the at conditional wave function, but also the fact that this wave function is evolving due to the fact that you know these configuration points that you start with are moving in time. This is what I try to um, uh, explain in here. So uh, imagine that this is the initial wave function you have. Then you chop it, you, you slice it with conditional wave functions one for each uh, uh, configuration point, right? And then what you do is you um, solve these equations of motion coupled to you know, the movement of these trajectories. 
the important point here is that these trajectories, or in order for the method to be uh, efficient, you, you, you need you want these trajectories to move um, following the support of the wave function. So um, a way to do this is to define these trajectories according to Baumian mechanics. So Baumian mechanics by construction allows you to define trajectories that, uh, that uh, follow uh, a continued equation, which is a continued equation corresponding to the time dependent relational equation. And then by construction, um, these, trajectories are, these trajectories are gonna follow the support of the wave function. Okay, so this is, uh, 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 at this point, everything is exact, let's say it's a, a, a you know, a purely uh, mathematical or theoretical problem. Now one needs to, to come up with uh, some method, some algorithm that allows you to, to compute all, all this all these things right um so uh okay but before that let me let me let me try to emphasize uh what is nice about this picture which is not only um this a, idea of you know um avoiding the the dead wood right the, the, uh, making the 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 slices follow the support of the wave function which would make um the the uh, an hypothetical algorithm efficient uh, it's also a, a, a nice idea that allows you to describe uh, a, a many body problem in terms of, of single particle wave functions, right? Um, let me, okay, this is a, a small video that I, I built up uh, a long time ago, but it's, I, I think it's, it's nice to show. So, so what you have on the, on the left-hand side is, is the solution of the full um, time dependence rolling equation in the, in, for one electron, one nucleus in, in one D. Right, so you start the, the 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 potential doesn't matter. It's just an example. What you have here is the initial wave function, and then you allow, uh, let it evolve in time. And okay, some dynamics occur, right? So this is the probability density, the evolution of the full probability density along this this particular potential, right? And what you have on the on the right is um, the nuclear conditional wave functions that I talk about. Uh, for three different uh, nuclear uh, uh, configurational uh, initial positions, right? Um, and each of these, you know, dashed lines here uh, cor would correspond to the to the conditional wave function. Okay. So let me show you how uh, the same exact dynamics uh, look like in in the eyes of this single particle uh, uh, nuclear uh, wave functions. So the density is reconstructed from uh, these conditional wave functions. And what you see now is that, you know, the splitting of the wave function of the, of the probability density is now very clear in terms of, of, of the, these effective potentials that arise in, the, in, this, in this single particle formulation of the problem, right? So, you know, this, this basically this, uh, this branching of the, of the probability density can be now associated to to deep peaks in the in the effective potentials that come basically from from the kinetic correlation potential that I showed before. So these these um, these holes here are basically um, complex in nature. So uh, associated to them, there's there's a there's a scalar potential uh, which is real. Uh, has a real part and an imaginary part. So th these holes here act also as a as a as a, um, as a source or uh, as a drain of probability, right? So okay, what what, what is nice about this picture? So the 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 um the this picture fulfills the original intention, which was avoiding this the computation of these border Penheimer surfaces, conical intersections, non adiabatic couplings. Everything is represented in the full position space. So all these quantities do not even show up, right? Not even very phases. Although, although of course you can you can reconstruct all these quantities and, and analyze them, right? Because you have uh, the entire information if you have a, a, a large enough ensemble of, of these slices. This is also from the from the conceptual point of view um, an exact way to treat uh, open quantum systems. And we have shown that this is uh, closely related with the stochastic Schrodinger equations. Um, and what I show in this video, right? So 
it's it's a way to extract the exact dynamics from the from the eyes, if you want, of, of single particles in a, in a many body problem, of course. But there, there's of course uh, disadvantages which come from the fact that the equations of motion that you end up with are are nonlinear um, with non-local sources and things, and um, and um, the, the the most important problem is that um, they are very hard to solve numerically because uh, as you see here right these these potentials are are very big um so they are very steep and um and this makes any you know any any propagation on top of these potentials a nightmare basically so um very nice from, from the conceptual point of view very unpractical um at the end though right um so that, that's where um, we started introducing approximations. So the first approximation um, is the what we call the emission approximation. Um, basically, uh, if you remember, this is the uh, uh, equations of motion for the for the nuclear and electronic conditional wave functions. So what you do is okay, let's let's try to do what every everybody does, right? So let, let's assume that my wave function is a simple product, a hard rate product, if you want of, of nuclear and electronic wave function. Um, but you use these ansatz only to approximate the kinetic and advective correlation potentials here and here, okay? So you don't start with this ansatz from the very beginning. You only use it afterwards uh, to uh, approximate these, these potentials here. Um, so what you end up with is, is the, this emission scheme, you basically recover uh, the hermeticity in your problem. So your Hamiltonian is, is back again uh, hermetic because these terms, when you use these ansatz, these mean field ansatz, become um, you know, purely time-dependent potentials. Um, and that that's, that's, uh, you know, introduces only somehow a global phase that is irrelevant to compute any observable of the change, right? So um, you can basically then approximate these equations of motion by these these two here, which are uh, again relying on a higher mission Hamiltonian, and um, furthermore they are uh, linear again, which is also very attractive from the computational point of view. Um, and um, and the trajectories now are coming not from the full wave function, but from single particle wave function. So if you're not familiarized with this language, this is this is the standard. Um, Velocity field that is defined in in Bohm in mechanics. So uh, these these velocity fields are by construction um, obeying uh, the, uh, the continue the full continued equation. Then, so they are expected to, these trajectories to follow the, the support of the wave function. Um, yeah, another relevant point is that although we use this mean field approach to um, to tackle these, these complicated potentials here, uh, this scheme is still beyond mean field. So that's, that's uh, we have some comparisons. Uh, let me show you one. Um, um, okay, this is, this is to analyze somehow the performance of this emission conditional wave function scheme. So that's, that's basically a model system that was used by, by Oliver Kuhn and, and George Nans. Uh, to describe the the sequential and synchronized proton transfer in in porphyry, right? So you have uh, basically two hydrogen atoms here um, that can move, you know, from here to here, from here to here. So there's a sequential process like this, no? Or there's a concerted process where everything happens at the same time. So the two protons are are evolving through the diagonal, let's say. So they can move. Like like this, like this, or they can move like this, right? So this is this is an interesting problem from the chemical point of view. Let's say because it talks about this immunization of this of this uh, of this process. But okay, we took this this model system. We um, also took the the Hermitian, um scheme, and we basically uh, prepare an initial state that is um, can be prepared with palm dump processes so you, you 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 excite your system with a, a laser you 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 move from the ground electronic ground state to the first excited state then you let it move 
and then you dump it with another laser pulse um, and put it in the ground state again. So in this way, you can you know move from from the ground state to this displaced initial state here. So you put this in here, which is our initial state, and then let it evolve in time. So what you basically get is, is this entire evolution here, which occurs uh, for this particular example in 55 femtoseconds. Um, so on the top panels, what you have is the reduced nuclear density associated to this entire dynamics here. Um, and on the bottom panel, what you have is the trajectories and the associated velocity fields. Um, so the first thing to note is, is that with this emission scheme, which is the, the let's say, the zero order approximation to this uh, full conditional wave function approach, is already able to capture all these interference effects that you can see in the, in the reduced uh, nuclear densities. But if you take a look at the trajectories, um, you also can notice that, you know, there is, for example, here, some quantum vortices here, which are, which are well captured by the, by the, by the method. Um, in here, uh, I'm not sure you can appreciate this, but there, there's uh, two large, very large red arrows, which would correspond to, uh, you know, trajectories tunneling through this um, um, saddle point, this maximum here that they can mention. Okay, so this, um, basically was a test um, to, to assess this uh, emission conditional scheme, which is the first one that we came up with. And uh, of course, in here, everything works nicely. In other examples, uh, it doesn't. For example, wh wh whenever there's a branching of the nuclear wave packet, um, a complete branching in two pieces of the nuclear wave packet, usually this, this, uh, this uh, scheme uh, fails. But it's a nice starting point to develop further approximations. That's the somehow the conclusion. Um, and this is and this is what we what we do next, right? What we did next. Um, there's uh, 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 another set of methods that uh, that we call interacting conditional wave functions um, that are based that rely on 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 the on the goodness of this of this emission conditional scheme. So they are build these methods on this emission scheme, as, as I'm going to show. So, um, okay, we we basically uh, um, explore two different ancestors associated to these emission conditional uh, wave functions. So the first one um, relies on 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 stationary conditional eigenstates, the one I showed before. So um, these are conditional um, wave functions that are time independent, that come from the time independence rolling equation. So you, we basically wrote the full wave function as, um, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a basis of the composition in terms of um, conditional electronic and nuclear eigenstates. Uh, of course, accompanied by by some coefficients that that are the ones that carry the, the time dependence of the entire uh, molecular wave function. That's um, that's a, a, an answer that is particularly um, suitable for preparing um, um, initial states, time dependent uh, to, for solving the time dependence Rollinger equation. Um, it's it's extremely. Uh, but it's highly parallelizable, and we use we use these ansets mainly to um, to solve the time dependent rolling equation in, uh, using the imaginary time uh, uh, um, propagation method, right? Um, and as I said, these these even if if these coefficients carry some some time dependence, uh, the fact that the the conditional uh, wave functions that we use are eigenstates of the conditional Hamiltonians makes these, these uh, particular ansets only suitable for equilibrium or, or close to equilibrium uh, uh, dynamics, right? On the other hand, we um, uh, export another ansatz, which is this one here, where we do something very similar, but now our electronic and nuclear conditional wave functions are time dependent. Okay, so this um, relies on the on the time dependent conditional wave function uh, framework that I explained to you before. So um, 
one could use these ansatz you know by by initializing the initial state using this this scheme here and then propagate according to this one here so it's it this this um the method based on this answer is is not um that highly parallelizable but still it's parallelizable and um what is important here is that this is is uh, very good in 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 um you know describing far from equilibrium uh, uh dynamics dynamics that that um that are large in amplitude that explore a large uh, uh, space of, of, of uh, in your problem, right? Good. So um, let me show you first some some results using the 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 this uh, frozen conditional wave function ansatz, this one here, and then I will go with uh, some other examples uh, where we use this this type of of ansatz. Okay. So. Um, this is this is um, the Born Oppenheimer surfaces for the for H two, basically. Um, so um, if you remember, um, these are these are constructed uh, solving the 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 electronic eigenvalue problem, the the purely electronic time dependent rolling equation. So the eigenvalues. Um, in that problem depend parametrically on the nuclear positions. So um, what you get are these bio surfaces that I introduced before. And um, we constructed these surfaces uh, with these uh, frozen uh, conditional wave functions approach using imaginary time and this, this uh, typical projection um, method, which uh, you know one, once you get the, the ground state, you project it out from your Hilbert space then you go uh, into the, the first excited state and, and um, so on and so forth, right? Um, um, so basically what we, what we got is that using a very small number of, you know, 32 basis, conditional wave function basis, you already get the right, the exact uh, BO surface, which is very, very, very interesting. So you, you have to consider that for example, hard trip for all calculations of the bio surfaces completely fails in capturing this. The asymptotic region, for example, will, would, would go into here. And all these surfaces are simply not, not even, even uh, uh, captured at all. Okay. So the method, of course, uh, as expected, goes beyond mean field. Um, this is another example. Uh, where Guillem, one, see, one question. Yeah, what are the sizes of the Hilbert spaces that you are talking about here? What are they? The sizes, how large are they? The Hilbert space, how, how large is it? So this is a two electron, one nucleus problem. I see. So it's, 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 it's still a 3D problem. So uh, as I said at the beginning, um, um, what I'm gonna show here are, are model systems only. So no, no, where I'm gonna explain it later, but we, we are still, we just started to implement all these in Octopus, um, but so far we haven't addressed real systems, let's say. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so in here, uh, we use this, this, again, this frozen uh, conditional uh, states to describe at this point, the linear absorption spectrum of, of, of the same uh, 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 molecular model system for H2. So this is basically a, a H2 in 1D. So two electrons in 1D plus the internuclear separation. This is this is the, the Hamiltonian that we use also here, also here. Um, and here what you see is basically how um, you know the, the, this frozen approach, this frozen basis approach captures uh, um, the, the exact absorption spectrum as a function of you know the, the number of excited conditional eigenstates you use in your ansatz and for different number of configurations, for different number of slices. Okay, so um, as I said before, right? So, so for for equilibrium problems, for solving the time dependent rolling equation, this is uh, you know quite efficient in, the, in, in terms of number of slices you need. Uh, when you go into dynamics, this frozen conditional functions approach is not uh, is not that efficient in the sense that you need to go up in number in the number of very uh, high number of, of slices, right? In here to converge to the exact solution, we needed 
2000, basically, um, um, conditional uh, wave functions. And uh, even we, we, we needed to go up to the third excited state for constructing, uh, for constructing our answers. Um, Hi, Guillaume. So can I, yes. can I just have to confirm that I'm understanding this well? So NC is the number of uh, trajectory points that you include. Yes. Right. And then, um, so as you go up in this panel, you are increasing the number of trajectories, but you're also increasing the number of excited states. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Let me, let me show you the, the answers again. This is the frozen conditional eigenstate answers. So you have an alpha, which refers to the, to the number of trajectories you have, right? And then you have also excited conditional wave functions, which uh, is, is this, uh, is, is destroyed by this, this, uh, this total number of excited states. And Good. And, and, and then, of course, you can, you can also try to, to, to induce some dynamics by, by pumping the molecule with the laser. Um, and this is, this is, these are results for the dipole, uh, electronic dipole moment, the expectation value of the dipole moment, again, for a different number of, of slices and uh, excitations in conditional wave function excitations. So what is important here is that it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely variational uh, uh, answer. So um, you will always uh, end up with the exact solution if you increase you know you, you, the number of bases in in in, in the expansion, right? Of your full wave function. Um, that's that's something that I did very recently, which is uh, in here. What I did so far is to you know use these conditional wave functions to separate um, mm -hmm. degrees of freedom, electronic from nuclear degrees of freedom, or 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 you know. Um, two elect uh, many body electronic wave functions. Uh, Converted into into single electronic wave functions, but also you can use these um, conditional wave functions to separate uh, geometric degrees of freedom. Let's say separate x from y, right? You can also do that, and um, it turned out that um, the 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 method is also um, capable of capturing these geometric correlations that you would find, for example. Um, when trying to describe a conical intersection, um, that's you know the the, the 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 circles, the dots correspond to the to the um, ICWF to the conditional wave function approach, and the surfaces uh, are corresponding to the exact. So uh, and this is okay. This is for for an extension of um, a model system that is called Sheen Matthew, where you can tune some parameters to get uh, very nice conical intersections and and. and and avoided crossings, things like that, right? Um, so again, you can use your, your conditional wave functions here, your conditional eigenstates, frozen states here to expand uh, 2D wave functions. So this is not two electronic degrees of freedom. This is one electronic degree of freedom, but in, in the X and the Y direction. Okay, this is, this is just for, fun somehow so so this is not the ultimate intention of this method that was just to realize that you know these conditional eigenstates are also useful to to the couple uh geometrical or internal degrees of freedom of, uh, at the single particle level right <clears throat> um this is now okay the results i'm going to show now are for the the dynamical basis the basis where our conditional wave functions are time dependent and evolve in time according to the Hermitian scheme using and you know being guided by by these Bohmian trajectories and um this is again the this sheen Matthew model which has been exploited to death uh, uh, to describe this this um, this non adiabatic dynamics where mean field uh, usually fails, right? So um, this is the 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 interaction potential that you have in this problem. Usually, it's it's uh, this uh, this is what we have included on top of it. So this is the model. Um, instead of using uh, bare Coulomb potentials, but you use are the zero functions, which are equivalent to using a type of softening parameter, right? Um, to avoid these, these, uh, these infinities. 
And then on top of this, we, we added the laser fill um, just to you know, promote some dynamics that, that explored, uh, that explored a, a large support of, uh, sorry, a large um, um, region of the Hilbert space. So th this is a situation where the frozen uh, conditional functions approach would, would basically fail. No? Um, and, um, and okay, in, in here we start in the ground state, ground state that has been constructed using the frozen uh, basis. And then one, once we have the ground state, we switch on the laser field and we switch from frozen basis to dynamical basis, dynamical conditional basis. So we allow them to move in time, uh, both because of an explicit time dependence and because they are being guided by the projectors. And these are the adiabatic populations. So the probability that sits on each of the electronic states in your problem. So um, in this particular problem, we needed um, 256 um, slices to converge to the exact solution, basically. And uh, what is important also is that uh, um, the grounds that uh, we were able to capture it with without using any excited conditional wave function. That, so that means that's a, 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 a um, you know the total number of basis functions that we have in our answer. So with 256, we basically reproduce the the the, the um, population dynamics, but also something that mean field approaches are not able to capture, which is the decoherence. Right? Usually, mean field um, approaches like um, um, time dependent heart rate, uh, RMFS dynamics, um, surface scoping, all these are you know giving providing a, a decoherence that that stays in a plateau after the laser field is switched off, basically. That's one example. Um, that's, that's another interesting example. So, so in here, I describe basically electron-nuclear correlation. In here, what I describe is electron-electron correlation. This is the um, impact ionization of, of, um, of H2 uh, with frozen nuclei. So here, we only treat the electrons explicitly. Um, and what I do is, um, you know, having a, 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 an impinging electron from the left uh, towards the TH2, where, where I have uh, um, where I have the electrons and then uh, with frozen nuclei. And then what I see are these two regimes here. This is the elastic regime and this is the inelastic regime. Um, and this is the, the reduced electronic density at, at the final time, which uh, I don't remember the number, but it's just, you know, um, well after the, 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 the scattering process. Um, and um, yeah, so basically the, the, uh, um, the conditional wave function approach captures in both cases with 128 slices, the exact dynamics. I put it here also the results from from um, time dependent extended heart rate fog, which are in red. So um, this is an extension of the standard time dependent heart rate fog uh, by including two different orbitals. Uh, and basically, um, you know, the, while the elastic uh, uh, process is well captured, the non elastic process is not well captured by, by these extended heart rate fog. Good, and finally, some different, um, a different, uh, completely different scenario in here. Uh, instead of nuclei, what we included are, 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 is a photonic degree of freedom, a single mode in a cavity. So in here, what we have is an electron sitting in the center of this, this cavity. This is the, the potential um, that, you, that we put by hand, a double well for the electron. And then um, we have a single mode and they are coupled uh, with a, ga with a with a lambda that uh, that uh, sits in the in the strong um, in the strong coupling regime. Right. Um, again, um, okay, I don't have here the number of trajectories that I needed to convert to the exact, but it's roughly the same. So it's 100, 200 maximum. Um, but instead of comparing to time dependent hard to fog here, what I did is compare to um, to multi-trajectory RMFS. This is a different type of, of, of mean field approach that is uh, somehow uh, conventional in this, in this type of scenarios. So um, 
you know, dashed lines correspond to this mean field, multi trajectory and fast, and solid lines on top of the black ones are deconditional function results. Um, while the populations are usually well captured by, by mean field approaches, um, the reduced densities or decoherence, all these uh, type of observables are, are, are very difficult to, to capture with, um, with uh, mean field approaches, while, while the conditional wave function, as you see, is, is, is pretty good in the mean. Um, I think the, 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 the um, light green corresponds to 10 trajectories, the, the solid, uh, sorry, the, the dark green corresponds to 128 again. Good, so I think I went a, a bit uh, too fast or not? No, it's, it's right on time, right? So conclusions, um, uh, well, conditional wave functions define a, a new starting point say completely different from from 90 percent 99 percent of approaches in, at least in the context of electronuclear dynamics and um, it's an annual starting point to define new approximations um, we basically explore two um, stochastic uh, ansatz multi-relational ansatz based on on on, on frozen or time dependent conditional wave functions and in all these cases, uh, we basically were able to convert to the exact solution, either using the, the frozen or the time dependent basis expansions. Um, and, and, and both to describe uh, uh, dynamical properties, but also static properties. And the, what we are doing now is, um, as I said, we are now implementing, so Kevin is taking care of that. The PhD student is, is super good in, 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 in coding. So he is trying to merge our our algorithms into octopus. <clears throat> we are also working in, in, you know, try to define a new um, TDD of T framework that we call conditional time dependence in functional theory. This is in order to be able to treat um, large, very large systems or medium sized systems. And um, and finally, the, there's two things that I didn't talk about. One is uh, spin, um, spin. Uh, you know, conceptually is more or less a straightforward, is, is, is about including spinners instead of, 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 of condition, standard conditional wave, fun, uh, sorry, wave functions. Uh, going into solids is, is, a, is a bit more complicated and we have not yet started exploring this. You know, how to introduce periodicity is, is, is still far from, from what we are doing at the moment. Um, and that's, that's all. Thank you very much, Guillem, um, for a nice overview of what the conditional wave function methods can do. Um, I, I have plenty of questions, but uh, mm. I wonder if anybody else does. Maybe Bruno, you can go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, I have, I'm sorry, Guillem, that I couldn't join in the beginning, so I lost uh, 20 minutes of the talk. No problem. <laughs> but uh, I, when I actually, when I connected, the first thing I saw was something that said, no very phase. What, why did you emphasize that? What, what do you mean? Yeah, um, so very, okay, in the context of, of molecular dynamics, um, you know, the very phase is what you, what, you know, it, it's a way to quantify the interference. Imagine that you have a wave packet here, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then you let it evolve. And then when it arrives at this point, it, it splits into two parts, right? One that goes, uh, into the left and one to the right, no? And uh -huh. when they, you know, glide again here, they generate some interference pattern. And, um, you know, very phase in, in, in this particular context uh, 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 is a way to quantify this, this, this or, or to predict this, this interference pattern, right? So it's due to the fact that the phase that, that, that the wave packet going uh, into the right or into the left just is different, right? Yeah. Um, but the, this in, in molecular dynamics is something that happens only when you work in the, in the bio representation, when you work with bio surfaces. So again, uh, probably this is something that you, that you uh, missed. Let me try to go back here. Um, these bio surfaces uh, to describe molecular dynamics is something that you get only after, you know, Introducing the the what is called the Bormann ansatz 
where you expand your full molecular weight function into, uh, into uh, a bunch of electronic states, which depend only parametrically on the nuclear uh, uh, positions. Mm -hmm. So only after introducing this, this expansion, you end up in this picture where the nuclear dynamics happen in, in, a, in, a, in a, a number of PO surfaces. Uh, but if you stay in the in the full re, uh, position representation, you don't have you don't have real surfaces, so you don't have conical intersections. Everything happens in a in a potential that is that is, you know, pure columbic, in some sense, right? So um, these very phases that arise in the context of molecular dynamics are always explained in terms of of these conical intersections that only make sense in the BO picture not in the full representation. Okay, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, may, I have, uh, may I have a question, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. hello, hello, Guillen. Uh, thank you for the, the nice talk. And I, I have a, maybe it's a, a very basic question. Uh, you have presented your method, the conditional mm -hmm. wave function method for two, uh, for electrons are a nuclei that they have very different uh, scales, yes. uh, length and energy. Is it possible to apply uh, such a method for, uh, for example, two different atoms that do not have uh, such different uh, energy and length scales? Yes, yes. In fact, um, I didn't mention it. Probably you didn't note, note it. But uh, um, so this example here, which is, this is the, the, the simplest approximation where I neglect the kinetic correlation, uh, kinetic and advent correlation potential. So the emission scheme, this is happening. So this is for two hydrogen, uh, 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 for two protons, basically. So that's, that's they, these are my degrees of freedom. So they are, the dynamic is happening in the same scale for both degrees of freedom that, that I treat in here. Okay. So that's that's and in, in particular when you when you apparently uh, I cannot say that for sure but uh, when you when you treat degrees of freedom that that um, that um, you know correspond to the same uh, 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 energetic regime let's say two electrons two protons but not electrons and protons or not electrons and photons right uh, two pro uh, the emission scheme which is the simplest one apparently works very, very well. So I didn't show, for example, also in here, right? Um, this is only two electrons here because the, the, I assume my, my, my proton to be, to be clamped, to be uh, uh, fixed. Um, in here, the emission, the emission scheme also works very good. Uh, um, it's, not, it's not plot here, but I, I, can, I can try to find some here. But uh, um, so apparently when, when the scales are, are comparable for the degrees of freedom that, that you're treating, the simplest approximation works uh, pretty well. It's only when you when you try to combine um, very different particles that you need to go beyond the the emission scheme. Okay, and another question: uh, These methods are uh, computationally demanding. I mean, uh, time uh, the time of computation. For example, the, the first example that you show us, the, the very nice with the Fuller N and um, ah yeah no. No, we are not. We are not at this point yet, uh, um, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm afraid that that uh, you know in, in 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 the current form of the of the of the method, we cannot scale it uh, uh, up to this to these sizes. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure about that. So so we need to include, for example, you know some some sort of semi classical approximation for or you know splitting the the, the full nuclear conditional wave function. Into classical pieces and 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 only keep the quantum nature for the for the for the lightest uh, uh, for the protons, for example. Treat the rest in a classical way. Uh, we need to to introduce more approximations uh, to to be able to tackle this. Not not, not even this large system, which is huge, uh, even to treat a uh, medium sized molecules. We're going to need to do that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, I had actually two related uh, questions. So uh, I guess back, back to the hermeticity point. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bit unclear to me what is it exactly that you're losing when you're... So I, I can see where the non-hermeticity 
comes from, I guess, the continuity uh, equation in the single particle space, in a sense. And so by, by removing that non-hermeticity and keeping unitarity, of course, everything's much simpler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you are also losing that sort of that flux that is going away from from um, uh, from that single particle state. So does this have to be, say, maybe a confined system for this to work? Is there is there any? I mean, have you have you tried to test or or to understand exactly? You know, what is the um, limitation? Okay, what, what we have tried to understand is is. Um, you know how these these kinetic and adverse correlation potentials look like, and and they are the responsible uh, for for making the the full Hamiltonian non non hermitic right. So so they they um, non hermitian. So um, I guess it's equivalent, right? Um, um, and um, these these potentials here basically. Um, become important where, where whenever in your dynamics you have you know some branching of the probability density and this is this this you can expect because or maybe not in here but in in um, the original sorry oh okay um so if, if okay in here the, this kinetic and correlation potential are, are written as sources and things out of the Schrodinger equation let's say but you can you can put them in in, in inside by dividing by the wave function, right? So if you do that, if you put them inside, then you 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 realize that they are, you know, potentials that depend on one over the wave function. So whenever you have nodes, that's that's they are going to be important. So that's why I'm saying that whenever you have um, a branching of your 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 wave function, no matter whether it is the electronic reduced density or the nuclear or photonic. Uh, then these 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 terms become important, and um, and and that's why neglecting these terms or or using this 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 their mission scheme is not that much related with with uh, the mean field nature of the of the of the problem, but uh, related with this branching of the of the of the probability density. And, and I guess the other. Yeah. My other comment, I guess, not related to nuclear physics. I think yeah. nuclear physics is probably the closest to what you've presented is that scattering example, right? We, we mm -hmm. would have, in our case, for instance, dynamically evolving neutrons and protons, but everything is dynamically evolving typically, right? We don't just, uh, we don't have a, nu a type of nucleus and a type of uh, electron yeah. unless maybe you, you freeze a core. Um, so in, in that situation, is there any... Um, I mean, the conditional wave functions, let's say if you fix the core or, or if you fix the nucleus and you let the electrons evolve, is, is that just mean field dynamics for the electrons? Or, I mean, is there anything else um, coming in in this, in the, in the correlation? Are there electron electron correlations, I guess, um, uh, in, in, in dynamics as well? Yeah, well, if you, if you fix the core, let's say, and, and you allow only to move the electrons, you can. Um, Describe this problem by 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 this conditional wave function approach. Um, and this is more or less what, I, what exactly as you were saying what, what what we did here, right? We we fix the the, the nucleus, the, the proton, but we allow the, the electrons to move. Um, and um, and this is like a a, a, a test bed to, to 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 see whether this this approach captures electron electron correlations. And uh, we basically saw that yes. Uh, it captures electron-electron correlations, not only beyond mean field, but um, also beyond, you know, um, this small extension, let's say, of time-dependent hard fog, which is this, uh, this time-dependent extended hard fog here, which, which fails basically to capture the, the backscattering uh, is, 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 the, is the, the worst part. I guess what I'm saying is your answer is in, in that, is in this case, your answer is an extended time-dependent hard fog or multi-configurational. It's a multi-configuration. Yeah, 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 exactly. In, in standard language, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's multi-configurational in nature because you have all these, uh, each of these slices correspond to a different configuration if you want. And, 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 and then it's, it's, it's multi-configuration. The, the, the only, let's say, um, particularity of this multi-configuration expansion is the, is the nature of the, of the basis elements, right? 
which are which are this conditional function. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, I'm then no. thank uh, Guillem again for a very thank nice and insightful seminar. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you. Good. Thanks to you guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.